in stories of what they think you're like but i've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and tell me that you're pleased and that i'm never searching for answers far and wide but i know we're all searching for answers only you provide us you tell what we need before we say a word
Hey, look around, say, keep, say, look, make sure you wave, see, take an accounting, okay? And you see anyone missing, next week you got to say, hey, I missed you last week, okay? Then you can be seated. How's that? All right, oh, thank you so much. I, I can get it from here. Thank you so much. People still rolling in, I like that. Keep them rolling in. Makes me happy. Hey, that, that last song, Christ Alone, Cornerstone. We're going to be talking about Christ as a cornerstone a bit today. And today we're going to be speaking about speaking the truth in love as well. Very important. So we're going to be in Ephesians. We're going to sort of jump into this message. We're going to be closing out this little section of Ephesians. Not all of chapter 4, but just this section. We're going to be in verses 15 and 16. But we're going to start in verse 14 because I want to keep things in context when we do this. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to read our text first before we pray, so to get us going. And I want to start in verse 14 of our text in Ephesians chapter 4. And, like we, saw, and we spoke on this last week that, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That's not what we want to do. When we go to verse 15, he says, but, but, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and knitted together by, every jo by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. I um, thank you for those who have come here, Lord, and I'm thankful, Lord, for those that are going to watch this on, on, on their computer, Lord, that, that this message, I hope, will, 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 will warm their hearts, Lord, will bring them closer to you. As speaking the truth in love is so important, and there's so many aspects to it that one message can't even begin to cover it. But we thank you and we praise you for this day, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Speaking the truth in love, is, it's important. And it's a real, so we have three points that we're going to go through today in this message. Three points. First point is speaking the truth in love. Growing up. You know, grow up. And the last one, being joined together. Three, three points I'd like to take, have us to have a takeaway today because there's a transition that takes place between verses 14 and 15. It says, but. But can mean no. It can mean, hold on. Wait a second, okay? What about this? Verse 14 was, was, was about doctrine being diluted by deceitful plotting. That's what happened in verse 14. But now we're speaking the truth in love. And think about the word of God in the word of men. The word of God in the word of men is so important. When we start looking at Bible translations, 
without looking at that. Which word is right? There's so many Bible translations out there, aren't there? Which word is right? We get doctrine from the word of God, and we have to understand the word that we're reading. With all the translations of the Bible out there, there can be a lot of hysteria. People get all caught up in what Bible translation is right. Now, the entire Bible has been translated into about 700 languages. The New Testament has been translated into about 1,500 languages. There's only like 197 or 96 countries in the world. Isn't that kind of wild? That says within countries, there's multiple languages sometimes. I just, sometimes, you don't think about this sometimes. I'm, I'm, I'm here in the US. We speak English, by and large, so it's just one language. But uh, we tend to think about the translation in our language being the highest calling, right? That's sort of an American blind spot, I would say. Because there's so many different versions in English alone. There was the Coverdale Bible. There was the Tinsdale Bible. There was the Geneva Bible. There was the Douay Bible. When we got to the 17th century, we got the King James Bible, which is called the authorized version. OK, keeps on going. And of course, you want to say authorized because you want to know mine's the best. Mine's authorized. Right? I mean, that's, a, that's a good sales slogan. People have criticized every version of the Bible that's ever come out, every new one. There's always been deep criticism. If the version of the Bible that you're reading is different than the one I'm used to, it's wrong. You see, I like my comfort. The Word of God should appear the way I want to see it. There's the English, English Revised Version that was done in the 19th century that was an update of the King James. And in the 20th century, we've got the American Standard Version of the Bible. Now, that King James Bible, that was bitterly hated when it first came out. Ooh, the 1611 Bible. No one liked this word. You know, it, it, they didn't like it at all. You know, the pilgrims, you know, they came down to Plymouth. This is a, what, this is the 400th anniversary or something? Of, yeah, it's 2020, right? 1620, 2020, I knew that. I knew that. And uh, so I, in Plymouth, there really wasn't a big celebration this year, unfortunately, because of COVID, which is really unfortunate, isn't it? I mean, it should have been a bang up. <laughs> Uh, celebration, but it wasn't. But when the pilgrims came over here, they would not allow the King James Bible on that, on that Mayflower. Oh, no. They used the Geneva Bible. That was their version. That King James was out of here. It's just interesting when you start looking at this. And of course, the King James Bible now was not, it's really not the 1611 Bible because we wouldn't necessarily understand it, though it's in English. I think it's this, you can check, I think it's the 1769 version that's the King James Bible now. And we sort of go, use the New King James Bible here. That's good. It's been updated. I, I don't know. I don't want to wrestle over all these things. But how do we decide on the word? How do we decide on that? This is a true story. There's two pastors we're having a debate over this. I can get you their names if you like. But they each had a version of the Bible that they liked. And they went back and forth as, you know, people will do. We love to debate, right? I'm right. You're wrong. No. They went back and forth. And finally, one pastor says to the other pastor, and this is sort of like a quote that they had for this. Well, the translation I like best is the mother's translation. What? The mother nature translation? What, what are you talking about? What he meant was simply that his mother's Christian life, the way, that, the way in which she translated the word of God, the word of truth, into Christian living, that was the version of the Bible that he liked the best. Speaking the truth in love is what she looked like. Speaking the truth in love is what she looked like. Shouldn't the output of our lives regarding the input of doctrine, right, cause us to look like Christ? We get a lot of input for doctrine. Is the output equivalent to it? This section of text that we've been in has been regarding unity of the faith that comes from the word of God. It's not how many verses I can quote, though that's good. How many verses am I wearing? Am I wearing those verses? Do I look like Christ? Teaching the word of God was done to equip believers for ministry. My life should be a thank, a, a thank you to God for what's been done in my life. But everyone's to minister. There's no bench to sit on if you are in Christ. Did you ever think about that? There is no bench if you're a Christian. You can't be benched. 
And we come to ministry. What constitutes a failure in ministry sometimes? You know, you start thinking about this. The ministry failed. What constitutes a failure? So let's, I'm going to give you just two great enemies of, a failures of, of ministry that have come there. There's more, but let's just take two for today. If I depart from the truth, compromise with a lie, whether in word or deed, ministry will fail. Or, if I have indifference with respect to the hearts and lives of those within the body or those outside the body, if I have indifference towards the troubles and trials that they have in life, ministry will fail. If I'm indifferent towards you and you're indifferent towards me, this ministry will fail. It will. Any ministry will. Either of those two failures is not the mother's translation of the Bible, the Word of God. This, this speaking the truth in love, to speak the truth, there's not a clear English translation of that, you see. That's a phrase in the Greek, okay, it is. More so than discrete words like speak and truth. Though they're in the definition, but it's a phrase. It generally it does mean to tell the truth, teach the truth, profess the truth, and this is good. However, speak the truth, it's a little bit, bit like the word love. You know, we have the word love, and our word, when we say love, is sort of inadequate, because we have agape love, which is a, a sacrificial love. We have philia, that sort of friendship love. We have eros, that physical love. So when we say, uh, you know, I love ice cream, it doesn't, that does, that's not a self-sacrificing love, right? It's just, a, and it, it's an inadequacy in our English language. That's all that is. It's okay, we get it. We look at it in context. We can figure it out. Of course, if you're learning the English language, it might be a little bit tough, <laughs> you know? A lot of folks here know multiple languages, and, and, and you could probably give me a lot, real lesson on a linguistics coming to English, because uh, as far as I, I'm, I have a hard time with it. Uh, we all do. But the best translation of speaking the truth in love is truthing in love. Or, well, and that's odd for us, truthing in love. That's not how we would speak, is it? No. Or it is to truth, or truthing it. It's an action as well as a speech, or a part of words. And those particular words are not in any translation. See, speaking the truth pictures the right doctrine or instruction being applied. In love, pictures the right spirit or attitude. Okay? Spirit or attitude. Because attitude is very important. It really is. We should, have great, we should have great love for the truth, shouldn't we? If you were accused of a crime and you're innocent, and I'll presume you're innocent, we're supposed to, right? <laughs> I'm supposed to presume you're innocent, okay? And you went to court, wouldn't you want the truth to come out? Do you want some deceitful prosecutor to be trying to just rail you? You don't. Did you want anyone to lie in that courtroom? No, you want the truth because you're innocent. You desire the truth more than every, if everyone tells the truth, I'm going to get off. There's people in jail because people have lied. I couldn't imagine being in jail, folks. I can't, it's so hard. But you know, people do things, don't they? But also, we need to do the truth, because it's an action. We need to do the truth. And the truth, how should it be done? It must be done in love. That's how we're to do it. Speaking the truth in love is present tense. It's right now. It's a continual choice of will, powered by the Holy Spirit. You know, there's other examples in the Word of God of continual actions that we do. They really are. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go is continual. It's continual. It's not one time. It's not a one-time event in our lives. Our lives should be a Thank you. A visible picture of the word of God for the gift of salvation that was given to us. And additionally, if we go to Philippians, uh, and we go to Philippians 12, to and 2, 12 to 13, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as, much in, my, not as in my presence, but, also, but all the much more in my absence. Because it's sort of like with children, right? Children are always good when you're eyeballing them. It's, what do they do when you're not there? But uh, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. 
A person is saved at an instant of time. The salvation is a point in time. It is a beginning. It is not the end. Salvation is from God. It's a free gift. That statement, to work out, work out your own salvation, tells us to do something with it, doesn't it? Work out your salvation. Do something with it. We're equipped by the word of God to minister, to work it out. And we'll do it with fear and trembling. Why? Well, because it's not of man. It's of God. And fear is respect, reverence, and awe. That's what fear is. It's not a horror movie. Fear is respect, reverence, and awe. We should be in awe of what God has done. Because Christ went to the cross for us and gave his life. There should be awe in our lives. We should check sometimes. When the last time you had awe in your life about what Christ did? We can get pretty, we can get pretty much going our own way, can't we? We can get pretty callous. Where's our awe? It really makes a difference. Are we truthing it? <laughs> Are we the mother's translation of the word of God? Speaking the truth in love. But another vein of the truth here is the spoken word. Just the words themselves, okay? And it's been said about speaking the, word, uh, speaking, speaking the truth in love. And I've said this before, and I'll probably say it again about every four months. Truth without love is brutal. Think about that. Truth without love is brutal. And love without truth is hypocrisy. That just sticks in my mind so much of the time. Our text, if you recall, in verse 14, it told us not to be like little children. See, children, they're younger, they're immature. They have a hard time blending this truth and love. Why? Simply because they're immature. That's all. That's all. And it's a maturity that they need to achieve, and it's a maturity that we need to achieve. Right along the entire chronological line, Hey, you know, maybe a 10-year-old will get down that, that, that truth and love ahead of me. I don't know. I'm not going to judge. But for a child, it says not to be like a child because a child's immature. If you love someone, if you love someone and shield them from the truth, it's not good. This is hypocritical. Being truthful without love is not merciful. It just isn't. And, you know, in Psalms 23, 6, 23.6. This probably is my, I, I, you know, do, we all, do you all like, a, a verse of the Bible and say, that's my favorite, that's my favorite? I think this one is the one for me. I've gone back and forth between this and James telling me to be slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. I go, I go back and forth. It's a one-two situation, but I think this is the one that's my favorite. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Does a trail of goodness and mercy follow me? And like all the, the current things, is, is the hashtag, the emoji, the image that people see of me, is it of one of mercy? Is it of goodness? When walking with God, we acquire something of his likeness, don't we? And unconsciously, we become witnesses to others of his beauty and his grace. That's what happens when we walk with God. We become the mother's translation of the word of God. The mark of maturity is when we share the truth with others and we do it in love. That's spiritual maturity. Sharing the truth, whether it's in a conversation between us or with an unbeliever, I don't, it doesn't make any difference. It's love in that conversation. In Proverbs 27, 6, it says, it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Back in verse 14, we had to watch out for deceitful plotting of those who are cunning and crafty. Ooh, you gotta watch out for those people that are just they're always loving you, it might be deceitful. But, but if I love you, or if you love me, tell me, are you, are you willing to tell me what I need to hear? It can be a wound. Do you remember last week I used the term, pain can be a holy messenger? That was that term that that guy, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, used. Pain is a holy messenger. Well, sometimes it is painful to hear things. But if I do it in love, or you do it in love and telling me, whoever, the dialogue, any direction, folks, whether they say, I, you, don't worry about it. But if I tell you in love and humility, the results will be edifying. To edify is to build up. 
That's why we tell each other the truth in love. In Ecclesiastes, I, you know, I spoke on this verse about, uh, I don't know, six months ago, and I really love this verse. Two are better than one because they have a good word reward for their labor. If they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe unto him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to lift him up. Oh, there's so much in that verse. If your companion falls, your friend, you're going to pick them up, right? How they fall is irrelevant. It's not a physical fall. It could be a physical fall, but there's so many other ways we can fall. Are you going to pick them up? If, and if you fall, don't you want help in reality? I mean, we really don't. You know, if I fall into sin, right? And the man who's speaking, I don't want. I said, say, oh, get away from me. I don't want to hear it. But in reality, if the Holy Spirit's in me, I really do want to hear it. I need to hear it. How else I'm going to stay in my sin? That's where I'll be. We need to hear the truth spoken in love. The question is this. If you're telling me the truth in love, right? Let's pick on Pete. It's easier. I won't pick on any of you. I won't. But if you're telling me the truth in love, can I handle it? How am I going to react? Let me ask you a question. If you tell me the truth in love and I can't handle it, what's that say about me? Think about that for a moment. And let it be you instead of me. If you can't handle that truth told in love, if you lose it, what's that say about our character in Christ? I think about this sometimes when I speak with you. Oh, that means so much. How we react, what we do, it is so important. It really is. And if I can't, why can't I? See, the wounds of a friend will build them up. That's what it's doing. They're building them up so that we can grow up. A second point. We want to grow up. But that's what it says in Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, which is Christ. We may grow up. That's a continuation of maturity, folks. Growing up. It should be our whole life. You know, whether you're 13 or 63 or 70, I don't care the age. We need to be continually growing because we aren't there yet. We aren't. Growing up, we don't want to be a child. We don't want to be tossed to and fro. We need to speak and receive the truth in love. And it's a two-way street. It just is. The question is, am I growing up? Am I becoming more like Christ? That's an essential question that we need to ask ourselves. Does the fruit of the Spirit, that was in Galatians 5.22, if you go there, that's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit was birthed by faith in me the day I was saved, at that instant of time. The obedience in my heart translated into loving action in my life. Is it there? Am I effectively mimicking Jesus Christ with my life? Are our lips in our life in sync? Think about it. Are our lips and our life in sync? Speaking and showing and growing in grace, growing in Christ's likeness. Do we have a life of integrity? If my lips say one thing and my actions say another, I am a wrecking ball. Think about that. That doesn't just go for the preacher. That goes for all of everyone. If I'm saying one thing but my actions are doing something else, I'm a wrecking ball. I'm a wrecking ball for, not for Christ, against Christ. Because my testimony won't be there. My life isn't speaking any real truth in it, is it? Make no mistake about this. The world will call us out and condemn us sooner or later if your lips and your life don't come together. If I try and speak the truth in the world after living in the world as the world, the world is going to call me out. The world does all the time. What are they going to say? You're no different than me. You're no better, hypocrite. My response always, whether I'm in any case, I say, well, I am no different than you. The difference is that Christ has paid my sin debt. I didn't do anything. You're right. I am no different than you. However, I don't carry a sin debt, and I don't want you to either. You got it. I'm a hypocrite. I can wear it. But what about your sin debt? This is what we need to be concerned about. And it might be fearful 
But we should ask ourselves, are our lips and our life in sync? If, if, we, if, we, do, if, if, we, if we all do, the word, and the word's available to all of us, right? And you can get it in any translation that you want. How high can a body be built up? And how far can a body reach out? Because a spiritually mature church with sound doctrine will have members that are mature in their thinking and living. This church can reach out in love. And the actions, and then the action is going to be an ongoing process. In verse 12, back, Paul told us that the, that, that, that the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, they had a job to do, to equip the saints for ministry. We're not equipped for ministry to be stagnant, but to serve. We are not gifted and edified to be complacent and be self-satisfied. It is not my version of the Bible or none. All the activity that we're doing, it's been ordered. It's been ordered to build up and expand the body of Christ. There's an order to all of this. The Word of God is the launch pad. The Word of God is the launch pad. It's the Cape Canaveral, the launcher. In John 13, verses 34, 35, you know, and I always, I always joke about this. If you go through the church, there's at least two places where this is painted onto the walls or onto a table. That's how important this verse is. It's painted on. It's on a table out back, and it's on a wall downstairs at a minimum in the, in, the, in, the, in the kitchen. I don't know where else. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, the Word of God is actually very focused, isn't it? When we're in the Word of God, we will be focused as well. That's what's important. But the focus should not create blindness, which can result from a self-focused church. We don't want to be a self-focused church. See, ministry can't wear blinders that cover our eyes, no. But ministry does need to be focused. It really does. On the contrary, when we look at this verse here in John 13, as well in other places, it shows that in exercising faith, in loving one another, in being equipped, in edifying the body, in not being tossed to and fro, a spotlight will shine on the, on the church. It says, all will know. You think about that for a moment. If we're loving one another, it says, all will know. Doesn't mean it has to be a sign out front. We got a sign out front. This week's is about holiness. All will know is what that's a promise Jesus has if we follow this commandment. What do you think is more effective? Going down the street corner here, I'll get up on a soapbox and start preaching to the traffic, or, or being a lighthouse that guides souls to Christ, which is what the body is called to do. You know, there's a time for street preaching but it's not in this section of text. This is the operational material for the body as a whole. When we, like, when we love each other, not just like each other, but love, Jesus said, all the world will know. You know, I haven't noticed when someone's in love, so, you know, a couple's in love or something, it shows and they glow, doesn't it? Oh, they're in love. You can see them. They're a little, ooh. They're in love. It's a natural thing. As a church, if we're in love, if we're in love with God, it will show as well. Because the world outside of the here, the world outside of these four walls, this church building, they really do want what we have in here. They just don't know it. Because people want love. People are desperate for love. They're going to all the wrong places, but they're desperate for love. People just don't know what genuine love looks like. Therein is the problem. Until we came to Christ, what was our image of love? Mine? My, love, my, my image of love was very self-serving. Translation, selfish. <laughs> That's how it translates. The Pete version, not the mother's translation. In verse 15, it said, But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Note the connection between verses 15 and 16. Verse 15 affirms that Christ is the head and that we are joined together now. 
And we get into verse 16. There's a lot in this verse as well. From whom, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by, every joint, uh, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. There's so much, so much in that verse. The church does edify or build itself up when it truly is joined together. Now, the whole body, joined together, knit together, fit together, has its origin sort of in stonemasonry, of all things. Stonemasonry. The origin of the term, because the Greek, you can, there's so much you can dig down deeper and deeper to start the Word of God, but this is one of the key, uh, key, key analogies you'll have for being uh, knit together. And for me, as I read through this and studied this, this was really good, because I, I, I love that image, because I love stonework. And, and, and I was looking, I said, that's, that's beautiful, as I looked at it. You see, I grew up the son of a landscape gardener. So from a very young age, I was in a cab of a truck. We didn't wear seatbelts back then either. I was in a cab of a truck with a crew of guys, and we're traveling around all summer long, okay? Soon as school's up, I mean, six, seven, eight years old, that's when I was out in the truck. It just went on, and that's what I did. And we worked. We cut grass. We cut trees. We planted trees, okay? We, we installed in-ground swimming pools, landscaped them, and we built stone walls. Stone walls. So one of my jobs was working with the stonemason, family friend, Ray. I called him Ray Ray. Ray Ray knew me from the day I was born, OK? Ray Ray knew me. He called me Petey. Petey. He was an Italian guy. Petey. Petey, do this. Petey, do that. Petey, do this. I love Ray. I mean, I knew him from when I was a kid. Ray told me to do something. I did it. I just went. I just moved and did it. So Ray was the, uh, the, the, the guy that was doing it. And we'd be building a wall someplace, and we'd be using cement. I was a cement mixer. It wasn't electronic. It wasn't gas powered. We had a trough. You had cement. You had sand. You had water. And you had a hoe. And you pulled the cement this way. And you pulled the cement that way. And you had to get it to the right consistency. Not too soupy. Not too thick. Just right. And it had to be just right to do a wall. You know, the first time we went down to a missions trip down to Costa Rica, we took a big crew of teens with us. It was really, really a great time. And we were building walls. We were building these uh, concrete walls of rebar in them. And at least there, all the way in Costa Rica, we had this giant electric mixer that could mix the cement. But not when I was growing up. We didn't have that. I, I, I missed out. So we'd be missing cement, and, and, and it was a good time. But there's other times we worked, and we made other walls that were called the drywall. A drywall has no cement. Drywall has no cement. You can learn about masonry today to an extent. You know, you can use this in your second job. Uh, but there I would be building a drywall, and I'd be bringing Ray Ray stone after stone. He'd accept some. He'd reject most. See, each stone had to pit it, fit in perfectly. If you're building a drywall, it just does. A drywall is a lot harder to build. There's no cement that binds the wall together. If a mason knows how to do a, a drywall properly, it's a challenge. One stone on top of the other. Each stone, it needs to fit in perfectly. If the stones are not placed properly and tightly, correctly, particularly here in New England, freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing, they become dislodged. If you don't believe me, what happens every spring driving on the roads, huh? Pothole city. Who's going to get a flat tire? Because that freezing and thawing just tears the roads apart. Same thing. Same thing with building a wall. And if you look sometimes, you look around New England, you see the old stone walls, some of them still standing. That's because those walls were fitted together properly. They're hanging around for a while. They just were. The stones just don't fall in place, though. See, there's someone at the helm. There's a master builder. Someone's at the head. Someone needed to be there. As we saw in verse 15, Christ is the head. The whole body is fitted together by Christ. It really is. In Ephesians 4, 7, it says to us, but each one of us Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, the grace here is not referring to saving grace. No, no, no. The grace here enables one to live a supernatural life in the context of exercising one's spiritual gifts, right? 
Here, grace is the ability to perform the tasks that God has called us to do. And in Romans 12, 6, Romans 12, 6 tells us, having then gifts differing according to the grace that was given us, let us use them. That's a great verse. That's wonderful. We have these gifts and abilities. And they're not to be neglected. They edify. Can you give? Give out of your prosperity. Can you, uh, can you help? Can you help people? Don't wait to be asked. Just help them. Do it. Can you teach? Just teach. Go down all the different gifts that you might have. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't be late. Just use that gift you've been given. You got a gift. An unopened gift is one that's not accepted. Think about that for a moment. It's not used. An unopened gift means I don't really want it. Would you want your gift refused? Hey, you know what September is? Pete's birthday month, right? Jerry's too. But I already got a, I already got a birthday present, guys. I got this fancy ninja coffee maker. Yeah, I got one already. Okay, it's not till the 18th. But imagine this. Imagine you brought me a gift for my birthday. You don't have to, but you know, it's encouraged. No. You brought me a gift. And I, oh, thank you so much. And I set it right down on the pew while I leave my Bible. And you come back next week, and that gift's still there. And you say, oh, Pete must have just forgot. He got so busy. You come back the next week, and your gift's still there. How are you going to feel? It's not going to feel good, is it? Pete rejected my gift. We've been given spiritual gifts. We've been given ability to do things. We are called to use them and do them. It's a great, great opportunity. In Ephesians 2 here, a little said before and after in our life, it's so important. So many of the verses that I keep referring to, Ephesians is so chock full of doctrine that it's like you can live in this for a year. I know it feels like you have been. Me too. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Huh? Yeah, we just sang that. And it, and it, and it, continue, it continues on here. Uh, to in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Paul's message to the church shows a stark difference from their life before Christ to their life after Christ. They were once strangers, but are now citizens. They were disjoint. They were not cohesive. They were separated, even enemies. Now each one, each soul is a stone in the building. Think about that. The Jews and the Gentiles in Ephesus, they were, they were they had enmity with each other. Now they're stones in the same building. In the same building. And not just any building, but a holy temple. A dwelling place of the Spirit of God. The foundation is Christ, the chief cornerstone, just like the song just before we came to hear the message. The apostles and the prophets, they had jobs to do in building the, in the church, didn't they? The body. But each stone is placed on another. We are the stones. We're being fitted together. Fitted together. In 1 Peter, it tells us in 1 Peter that coming to him as, living, as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also are living stones, being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Christ was rejected. At times, we're going to be rejected. But we are being fitted together. That's what's important. Being fitted together, loving one another, with each one of us doing our share. And each one of us doing our share in loving with each other is not going to be without adversity. There's adversity in our lives. Going back to the Old Testament, you might recall, you might recall Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Nehemiah is called the wall builder. We're talking about building walls, right? The wall builder. Israel, the Hebrews have been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Okay? They were taken away. 
And then the Babylonians were defeated by the Persians, more battles, but they're in, they're, they're, they're in, they're in exile from their homeland. Solomon had been commissioned to build a temple, and when the Babylonians took, it all, took over everything, they destroyed the temple. They destroyed everything. They went to town. It's in ruins. Now here's Nehemiah. Nehemiah is called the wall builder. He went to rebuild the wall, stone upon stone. He was given permission to do this by the king of Persia. But he received opposition. There's always opposition. He had many adversaries if you go through and you read through the book. Nehemiah's confidence was in God, not in himself. But he said in Nehemiah, in, in, verse, in chapter 4, his, so it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held spears and shields and bows and wore armor. And the leaders were behind, behind all the house of Judah. <coughs> These wall builders, they were building a wall. Oh, and those who built were on the wall. And those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that uh, as one hand they worked in construction, in the other hand they held a weapon. Could you imagine working this way? These wall builders. That's what they were doing. That's what they were called to do. They're working effectively, each doing their share. You see, they loved each other so much, they were willing to fight for each other. They were willing to lay down their lives for each other. The truth of their lives was spoken by their actions. No greater love can we have than to lay down our life for another. And that's what they were doing. Sort of like that mother's translation again, huh? Nehemiah went to restore the wall, but much more was restored than a physical wall that was, be, that was being fortified here. Nehemiah, though he had lived far away from his home, okay, he never lost his relationship with God. Think about this for a moment. The, Nehemiah, Israel had been in captivity 70 years before Nehemiah got to come back. Think of this for a moment. What faithful person, a parent, a relative, or a friend, demonstrated a faith-filled life for him to copy. Huh? Someone's actions built him up. He longed to be back where he belonged, where Israel was. Those Hebrews, they were in captivity 70 years. Their homes had been destroyed. The temples destroyed. They were in captivity. They wanted to return. They wanted a relationship restored with God. That's what they wanted. And in many respects, just as a side note, a lot of that relationship was always restored if you look at the entire account here because the scribe and priest Ezra actually had already gone back before Nehemiah and already the, the word of God and the law of God was being spoken and preached in Israel before Nehemiah ever got there to build the wall. In Nehemiah, uh, in, in, verse eight, in chapter 8, 18, it says, Also day by day, from the first day to the last, he read... That's Nehemiah. I mean, that's uh, Ezra. He read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly according to prescribed manner. You see, Israel had forsaken God. They had forsaken the word of God. Now, they were running to the word of God. Seventy years of captivity is a pretty severe refinement. It really is. I remember when I was that gopher in the summers, getting stones. Ray would take those stones. He'd look at them in critically because he had an eye. He'd reject, he'd reject them. But other stones, turns out, were refined. Meaning what? He took a mason's hammer and a chisel, and he pounded them. He removed the parts that prevented the stone from fitting in. He formed the stone. That, 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 no stone could rock in place on the, on, the, on, the, on the wall. They all had to be steady. Every stone fitted together. See, the hammer in the hand of a skilled stonemason doesn't break rocks. It forms a masterpiece. The word of God is that hammer. We are being refined, ladies and gentlemen. 
Everyone wants to fit into somewhere in the world, don't we? Everyone wants to fit in somewhere desperately. In doing so, we take on the image of that which we fit into. We need to take care where we place ourselves, where we desire to fit in. It's very important. Because wherever we decide to fit in, we're going to take on that image. It is. See, the Word of God is a hammer. The Word of God is not a list of do's and don'ts. It just isn't. With punishments associated with failure. Christian, never live your life that way. The Word is a light onto our path. Our sin is more than bad behavior. See, sin is a heart condition. In Ezekiel, 11, verse 19, about speaking the truth in love. Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit in them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. Speaking the truth in love, it's a hammer that builds and unites. It's the word of God. We are being fitted together. We're to speak the truth in love to one another, to everyone we encounter. God is changing us. He'll remove that stony heart. We want to be the image of Christ. So always speak that truth in love wherever you're at. Cling to the truth. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day, Father. I thank you for this message, Lord. And uh, Father, please help us to to know what the truth is, the doctrine that you've taught us, Lord, the instructions. Help us to know what they are. And we take joy in following what you'd have us to do. That would be a joy of our life. We thank you and praise you, Jesus, for this morning of your goodness. And Father, I thank you for all those that are here this day to hear this message and for those that will watch it on their computers. We thank you and praise you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 So we fit it together, huh? We got we to get it together to get fit together, right? And we all need to keep working at getting it together a little bit because uh, we get a little bit disjoint sometimes. But it is good to see you all here. I know people are away, some people in New York, some people in Vermont, all these, you know, jet setters from Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, I'll tell you what. But, but where are we at? I'm thinking, you might get an email this week. When it's, I want to start up. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I've been... Praying about this, I'm having Friday night prayer night uh, at some point. So you, you might be receiving an email this week saying it looks good, that we can just come here and pray. No message, no nothing. We'll be sitting like this, spread out a little bit, wearing face masks, helmets, you know, our jet packs, staying safe, but just praying about whatever's on our hearts and talking, just a time. It's on my heart, and I hope it's on yours. Uh, I want to mention just a couple other things, then we'll take up an offering. You know, why don't we do this? For an offering today, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to leave the plates up here. So after the service, you just come up and put your offering in the plate. Let's keep it simple today. It'll be right here in the front, you know. Uh, if you need help, like, you know, because you need a dolly because you're going to put, like, gold bars in there, don't worry. Mark will help you. Uh, uh, Dimitri will help you. Uh, we, we, we accept gold bars. But uh, hey, I just want to mention a couple of things, you know, we're... I'm going to confirm about you know, helping Tere uh, the move for Teresa, you know, make sure they have the truck over there. But I just want to say, you know, different people have been going over, and I want to give a shout-out. So you got to give a shout-out sometime, right? you got to embarrass people and edify them, so that's what I'm going to do, because I'm here and you're there, and i got a microphone. So Dita and David went over the first day to help them, and they did all this packing. Turns out they did one of the worst rooms in the place. They did this room on the second floor that was full of knickknacks. I know about you, but knickknacks give them a crack. I mean, I just, they took hours. So Jimmy, you know, Teresa's oldest son, he said yes, he goes, Pete, you just got to tell those guys. What they did was incredible. They were like, and then, and Crystal was there, and Sandy, they were, oh, yeah, what they did was phenomenal. I guess you guys just knocked it out of the park because they were overwhelmed to have to do it. But Dita and David, like, were machines, I guess, for several hours. So I just want you to know, you, it's a funny, the things you do sometimes, right, the impact that has on people, you don't know. I'm not going to ask them, but I know they were tired afterwards. And they didn't, 
And I know David didn't love it. Boy, I hope, David, you didn't love it. <laughs> if you did, we're going to talk. But, uh, but he did it. And that's to be, that's to, that's to be you know, edified because it was, it was so good for this family to see a mom and a son show up and get this done. So I just, I just need you to let you know that. And uh, we're going to take up the, the offering. I just want to mention one other thing. Next week, uh, we'll do the message. Afterwards, we're going to break at this point, okay? And we're going to go like, <sighs> and then we're going to tape. And I'm going to do a little uh, snippet on where our finances are at because I want you folks to always know where the, where, where the money's at. We have, with the whole COVID thing, this is a way of getting it through. A couple of bar graphs, 10 minutes of your time. It'll be fine. You'll make it. Uh, I'll speak at this speed or even faster. I don't know. I won't keep you long. Uh, the move, Friday night prayer. And I just want to read this thing. So you recall the Trabulsis, okay? They're over in Lebanon. We support them. The explosion happened in Beirut. So I received this email. I just want to read this to you. Brothers, dear brothers and sisters, one month has passed since the massive blast in, in, in Beirut. Isn't that amazing? A month's gone by. Doesn't time fly? Um, life is coming back, but slowly with much pain. Praise God. Danielle woke up without, with, amazing. Danielle woke up, but without the ability to remember names or words, uh, but had sentences. However, she's aware of her family around her and expresses love to them. Adele is still having, uh, is still waiting to have another operation on her arm. Others are much better. The repairs of the houses and churches and cars are, are advancing greatly. Some have, uh, uh, we have some great uh, uh, achievements. And it's interesting, because this happened a month ago, but this is what he writes. We are coming to the end of a four-month mission for food distribution. So they've already been dis distributing food over in Beirut and Lebanon area. We are thankful to God for all, the, the, all who helped with the, with, in this misery, Hope to be able to return to see to some time to see you soon, and it bless everything, E.T. Uh, Edgar Trabolsi. So, once it, we're sitting here comfy, right? We got the AC on, pretty good. Pizza about done. You're gonna go home, get a piece of pizza. Some of us are gonna go help move. Boy, think about working in a place that's bombed out. So that money we sent over there, uh, praise God that they can use it, buy some supplies, do it for some people because it's an amazing thing there. But. It's been a good day so far. So I and what we'll do is we're gonna we're gonna close in a song because I got come on up here, guys. Come on up here, guys. If you have an offering, the plate's right down here in the front, okay? Right down here. And right after we get done singing, I'm gonna give a phone call over and confirm that they got the truck and everything set. So those of us who can go over to lug some boxes, we can. Does that sound good? Please stand. Well while, while our praise team sings us out of here. sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky.